Hazel for PokerVIP.com. Today we're going to be talking about 3-bet pots without the initiative. So we're 3-bet preflop and we are playing postflop as the caller. We're going to tackle this issue by looking at a few examples. The first example is we open raise the button and we call the 3-bet from the big blind who is aggressive. And in terms of population reads, it's good to have a default strategy, especially for the lower limits. And the way we can do this is by having an idea about what the most common exploitative tendencies of our opponents are. So to give a rough guide, the average player is probably c-betting a flop way too much in 3-bet pots after they 3-bet, but they're not following up with an adequate amount of turn barrels. So the way we can exploit this, and the way we should potentially be playing against an unknown, is to not give the flop c-bets very much credit whatsoever because we'll probably find if we look in our database at some of the players we're regularly playing against and we have a look at their c-bet frequency in 3-bet pots we'll probably find that it's very high very commonly it's above 80 percent sometimes even above 90 percent so one of the mistakes we can make against such a play is by calling pre-flop and then proceeding to play fit or fold on the flop just because our opponent c-bets does not necessarily indicate he's connected with the flop in any particular way, we just know that he c-bets because that's his default strategy to fire a large amount of continuation bets. So our default strategy should be not to give too much credit to flop c-bets, but really evaluate the strengths of our hand facing a second barrel because the average player does not barrel frequently enough. Generally speaking, we should not be folding that much on the flop against an unknown. We should be bluff raising certain textures and we should be floating certain textures. And the ideal result is we float the flop after opponent C bets, he checks the turn, we bet on the turn, and in this particular situation, sizing is important. We don't want to bet too big in this situation. Because very commonly when a player decides to C bet the flop out of position and then check the turn, their range is often constructed in a very specific way. Either they have complete air, which they're giving up with, and we don't need a large bet in order to take the pot away from them if they don't have anything, or they are trapping, and if they're trapping, we want to lose the least amount of money when we get check raised on the turn. We'll probably find for the most part our opponent's range is going to contain air, because many players will continue firing a second barrel if they have a strong made hand. So the majority of our opponent's range will be weak, but we don't want to lose a ton of money that small amount of the time when our opponent is trapping and going for a check raise. So our default strategy is float the flop or bluff raise a flop depending on the flop texture and think about taking the pot away on the turn if we float the flop and our opponent checks and hopefully on the flop we can take the pot down reasonably frequently with a raise as well simply because our opponent has a very high c-betting frequency however this all changes if we have information on our opponent and certainly we may find this strategy is not effective against some players for example if a player has a very low c-bet frequency in a 3-bet pot then it doesn't make sense to float a large amount of hands on the flop we want to think about playing a little bit tighter if our opponent is not c-betting that much. So let's think about the following example. We open raise on the button and we have 9 of clubs, 10 of clubs and we call a regular size 3-bet. And we're going to think about what we're going to be doing on each of these flop textures. So assuming we do actually have a sample size in our opponent, what do we think are the most relevant stats in constructing a solid defense post-flop? So let's take the first scenario where our opponent bets the flop on the queen 7 2 rainbow board. Ideally, for the purposes of this, it's very useful to have a pop-up specifically designed for 3-bet pots. Actually, this is something that many regulars don't have. They maybe have the basic stats for 3-bet pots, things like c-bet flop, c-bet turn maybe, maybe fault to c-bet flop, but they generally don't have any additional stats on top of these. So it's recommended to have some kind of 3-bet pot pop-up which looks something like this. So all of the stats you see here, they're just taken from a random player in my database. All of these stats here are to do with how our opponent plays in 3-bet pot. So there's no single raised pot information here whatsoever. So we can see we have the c-bet information on flop turn and river, fold to c-bet. Uh, we also have fold c-bet to raise so we can work out how effective our bluff raises will be. And then we can also see how often our opponent raises versus us when we're the ones c-betting. So although we're talking about primarily playing as a cold caller here, we also need some information for when we're the aggressor. So how often is opponent going to raise versus our c-bets. And then some of the more interesting stats are here in this third row here. For example, when our opponent doesn't c-bet, how often does he check fold? 
And we may find some players, especially since they're c betting very, very frequently, when they check, we may find that they are actually check folding with a very high frequency because they would be c betting many of the hands that they want to continue with, especially if they have a c bet frequency of 90% or so. So, going back to the example, which of these stats do we think are the most relevant? Well, certainly facing a bet on this particular flop texture, the first thing we're going to check is how often does our opponent c bet. We probably noticed that. Firstly, the texture is dry, and one thing a dry texture should tell us is that we probably don't want to be bluff raising too much. In fact, we'd probably be more likely to bluff raise on this second texture here, King Jack 7, because this is also how we play our value range. If you imagine we had something like pocket 7s on each of these two textures, in the first example, we'd probably just call against our opponent's continuation bet because the texture is very dry, whereas on the second texture, we might want to think about raising because there's certain amounts of draws our opponent can have. There's also more value hands he can have that he can potentially pay off a raise with. So in terms of bluffs, we're generally going to be playing these similarly to how we'd play our value range. So on the dry texture, we'd think primarily about floating. And on the turn, we are really looking to hit one of the better cards for our hand. So you can see we have a number of outs here. We have plenty of clubs, which can give us a backdoor flush draw. We have things like Jack, which will give us an open ender, or an 8 will give us an open ender. We also have some gut shot cards as well. We have any king can give us a gut shot. Any 6 can give us a very weak gut shot. So usually we're going to be thinking about continuing potentially on the turn if we improve to one of these outs, whereas facing a second barrel unimproved, then we should generally just be folding and giving our opponent credit as discussed. However, we want to base this on their stats. So if we see our opponent has a very high flop c-bit here, then we definitely tend towards floating much wider, even with hands that don't include good backdoors. Whereas if we see our opponent has a reasonably low flop c-bit frequency, we might still end up floating a hand like 9 of clubs, 10 of clubs, because it has pretty good back doors, but we're certainly not just going to be floating anything. We probably definitely want to think about tightening our floating range on the flop if we see our opponent has a very low flop c bet. So assuming the turn comes something reasonable for us, so maybe something like a king or something like a club, we then want to think about how we can continue on the turn. Now assuming the turn comes something like the king of clubs, we are aware that there are some potential draws out there now, or especially if it comes something like a jack, there's more draws our opponent can have, and we might want to think about having a raising range on the turn. So assuming the turn comes something like an offsuit jack here, and we pick up an open ender, how do you think we can determine, based on our opponent's stats, whether it's a good spot to think about raising the turn or just calling the turn again? One thing we can of course look at is our opponent's barreling frequency. We might find if he doesn't barrel the turn very much, we're not going to have much fold equity with a bluff raise. And this is the most important thing when we're bluff raising is that our opponent has a tendency to fold or will at least fold some percentage of the time. So if we see our opponent has a lower turn barrel frequency, this may indicate that we're going to have less fold equity. But of course we can also check the stat fold turn versus raise. If our opponent is folding very frequently to turn raises, we may find that raising the turn is going to have a higher expectation than calling. Also, one thing to think about is, even though we're on the turn, we want to think about his stats for the following street. So, for example, something like river barrel may be relevant in this case. So we may find, for example, if our opponent has a very high river barrel frequency, this may not necessarily be good for us, whereas if he has a very low river barrel frequency and we also check and see that when he skips his river c bet he has a high check fold frequency, then this is going to add to the expectation of floating the hand because we may find that if we just call on the turn and he checks the river, then we have a very profitable bluff opportunity in that particular situation. So even when we're on the turn, we want to think about the river stats when making a turn decision, and even when we're on the flop, we want to think about the turn information. So we may find, for example, that even if our opponent c-bets the flop somewhat wide, and therefore we should float somewhat wide, if he has an extremely high turn barreling frequency, we're going to have to fold many of the hands in our flop floating range, assuming he doesn't fold his turn c-bet to a raise, in which case we can obviously call a flop and then raise the turn. But assuming he's the kind of guy that doesn't fold to raises, and he has a very high flop and turn barreling frequency, we may find the appropriate adjustment is to actually tighten up our flop floating range. So we know by default, if we just see someone has a very high flop c-bet percentage, we're going to be floating very wide. But this may not necessarily be the best strategy if we then look forward to the turn stat and see our opponent is barreling the turn very frequently and is going to cause us to fold many of our floats. It may be recommended in this situation to actually tighten up 
our flop floating range slightly and then we're going to have a much stronger range on the turn we're going to be able to play more effectively against his second barrels especially if we know he's two barreling with a wide range so if we now look at the second type of flop texture we have additional options on a drawy texture because we want to think about bluff raising that doesn't necessarily mean that floating is incorrect, so we need to make the decision between whether we want to float 9 of clubs, 10 of clubs on this King Jack 7 board, or whether we want to bluff raise. We want to find out which is the best option in terms of exploitation. So one of the first places we should look, again obviously the flop c-bet frequency, but now we can look at his fold flop c-bet to raise. And we may find he's folding very frequently to raises, and if this is the case, then it may be profitable to go ahead and raise. But this is not the only factor. Even when we're raising, we want to look ahead to the turn stats because another interesting stat we can incorporate here is how often our opponent folds to the turn barrel after he bet calls the flop. This is another stat that many regulars are simply not incorporating into their game, which may in fact be very useful. So a common assumption is when we see our opponent has a very low fold C bet to raise is that we shouldn't bluff raise anything because he's not folding. But if we then look to the turn information and see that he has perhaps an 80% fold turn after bet call flop, we may find that actually we still have a very profitable bluff raise because the majority of our profit is going to come on the turn when our opponent is folding way too frequently. So always make sure that we look at the stats for the next street, maybe even the next two streets, because in an extreme example, perhaps our opponent doesn't bet fold the flop very much, he mainly bet calls, and perhaps he doesn't fold to turn barrels, but perhaps he folds to river barrels very frequently. So in order to construct a complete game plan, we have to take into account how our opponent is playing on all streets. So even when we're on the flop, sometimes some of the river statistics we have on our opponent may be relevant in constructing an overall game plan. So in terms of floating, we may find floating is more profitable in scenarios where perhaps our opponent doesn't barrel the turn very frequently. And this is good for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we have the option to free roll some river equity by checking back the turn. So we get to see two additional cards for the price we pay on the flop when we float. The other good thing that could happen is we find that our opponent has a very high check fold after he skips his turn c-bet. Again, these are stats we have in our pop-up. So we might find that when he doesn't barrel the turn, he's going to be check folding with a very high frequency. And we may find exploitatively, especially if he has a low flop fold c-bet to raise, that we actually make more money by floating as opposed to bluff raising. We can also look at things such as how often does he fold his turn c-bet to a raise. Because we may find, for example, that he has a very high fold flop c-bet to raise, and he has a very high fold turn c-bet to raise, and actually we don't mind instead taking the pot down on the turn as opposed to the flop, because when we raise the flop and take what's in the middle, we take a small pot, whereas if we float and delay our bluff raise to the turn, we actually trap a large amount of additional dead money there, especially if we know that he is going to be two barreling wide and he's going to be bet folding the turn a ton. And by extension, in another extreme example, it may be the case that assuming the stacks are deep enough, we're primarily talking 100 big blind stacks here, and we'll probably find 100 big blind stacks we're not going to be able to get a bluff raise in on the river, but as the stats get deeper or as our opponent's c-bet sizings get smaller, we may find that we actually have room for a river bluff. So in an extreme example, we may find that the expectation of double floating and going for a bluff raise on the river if we miss is actually the highest expectation of them all in some cases based on our opponent's stats, of course. The other advantage to, in some cases, delaying our raise is that we take better advantage of our implied odds. So we have something like 9 10 of clubs here, and let's just assume if we do hit a queen, we have a very strong hand which beats our opponent. Or let's say we hit an 8, which is going to give us the nuts in this case, an offsuit 8. We have very, very good implied odds. Whereas if we turn our hand into a bluff raise, we don't necessarily take full advantage of our implied odds. Whereas one way we can fully take advantage of our implied odds and our fold equity in some cases is delaying our bluff to a later street, because first of all, we get to see additional turn and river card, so we get to fully realize the equity. Because obviously one thing that could happen if we do bluff raise his hand is we get jammed on and we end up having to fold our gut shot and we don't get to fully realize the equity. So floating does have some advantages in some situations in that we get to see the turn and river card more frequently. We get more chances to actually make our draw and then extract a ton of money, especially if we have good implieds, which may happen if our opponent's bad or if the stacks are deep. And also we don't necessarily take away our opportunity to bluff because we can still turn our hand into a bluff on a later street if we decide it's profitable to do so.
So I'm not saying floating is better than bluff raising. Actually, bluff raising in many cases is going to have a higher expectation than floating. And one thing that players don't do is they don't have enough of a bluff raising range in three bet pop on certain flop textures. So in general, I would imagine the expectation of raising is going to be higher than floating against an unknown opponent. But we're mainly interested in exploitative lines here, and we want to use our three bet pop pop up to establish which is the most exploitative and plus EV line to take. So if by this stage you don't have a properly configured three bet pop pop up, then I recommend that you create one as soon as possible, especially if you have a good sample size and some of the regs, or you do other things such as data mining, which allows you to have a decent sample size in your opponents, then having a decent three bet pot pop up is one way you can get a big edge in three bet pots. So we've mainly talked about opponent betting the flop, and then we have the second scenario where our opponent checks. So assuming our opponent checks, the first place we're going to look is what he does when he skips a C bet. So just to show you this on the pop up, you can see here we have skip C bet and check fold, check call, or check raise. Many players actually have a check fold that's significantly too high. So the way we can exploitatively play against this, and, and the way you should probably exploitatively play against unknowns as well in terms of population reads and common tendencies, is you should assume that their check fold is way too high when they don't see bet as a preflop three better and we should be betting very wide in this situation hoping to take the pot down. However, this can all change exploitatively if we see our opponent has a reasonable check calling and check raising range. So assuming he has a very high check fold, we'd obviously think about just firing nine of clubs, 10 of clubs on both of these flop textures, and we'd probably fire a decent amount of other hands that have completely missed as well. So if we have something like Ace eight of hearts on either of these textures, exploitatively it might be a good spot to bet because our opponent's check folding way too frequently. Whereas if we check his pop up and we see he is somewhat balanced and he's defending his checks with some check calls and check raises, then we're going to be a lot more selective about the type of hands we bet on the flop in that situation. So in such an example, if we hold ace eight of hearts, we should immediately realize that it's probably one of the weaker holdings we're gonna have in our range. It doesn't improve very well on many turn and river cards, we're probably going to find the best option is to go ahead and check back in that particular situation. That doesn't necessarily mean we're giving up on the hand. For example, we may find that when our opponent checks twice, he is generally folding very frequently, because assuming that he is check calling and check raising on the flop with some frequency, that implies that he's also checking some of his value range. And the common thing he's going to do with his value range is after we check back the flop, he's going to think about leading the turn. So we may find that if he just checks the flop and the turn, of course he could be double checking as a trap, but the most likely thing is he has part of his range that's not his value range. We may find that we can bet exploitatively wide on the turn in this particular situation. So let's move on to another example. And in this particular example, we are open raising from early position this time, and we are facing a three bet from a tight opponent who is in the small blind. And the reason we're looking specifically at this situation is because it's a spot where I think many of you are probably making some mistakes. So in order to find out if you are making mistakes, then see if you can answer these questions first of all and decide what you do. So we have pocket tens. The first flop is king nine seven and their opponent bets half pot. What would you do with pocket tens in this situation? And in the second example, the flop comes eight two two. So we have an over pair. And again, our opponent C bets half pot. What would we do in this situation? So the first question, let's take the first example, King 9-7. The main issue we have here is this is very different from playing against a 3-bet when we open the button and face a 3-bet from the small blind or big blind. The main difference here is, firstly, small blind is pretty tight in terms of 3-betting, but also in terms of the positions involved, he's much more likely to be 3-betting a very tight range against an under the gun open compared to the range he might 3-bet against a button open. In fact, there is a reasonable chance that his range here is literally kings plus, kings and aces only. And the reason for this is many players will actually flat ace-king offsuit versus an under the gun open, and they'll also flat queens and jacks. And, you know, maybe they occasionally 3-bet queens, maybe they occasionally 3-bet ace-king as well. But we can assume that they don't necessarily have all combinations of these hands in their range, whereas they very likely have the vast majority of the aces and kings combos, unless they slow play some of them pre-flop, but this is generally going to be less likely. We can probably safely assume our opponent has all combos of aces and kings. So on this first texture, it should be very easy to see why we are absolutely crushed because 
Our opponent either has kings or aces, and if he is 3-betting a little wider than he normally does, and he has ace-king, he has us pretty crushed. And if he has queens, he obviously doesn't like the flop texture himself, but we're still pretty crushed because we have two outs to improve against something like pocket queens. So the first example should be somewhat easy. We are completely crushed by our opponent's entire range, and we should definitely think about just check folding in this situation. But it's interesting just to contrast this to this exact same flop texture after we open raise tens on the button and call versus an aggressive big blind three better. Now we're in a situation where it should be a pretty easy float on the flop. Probably doesn't make a good hand to turn into a bluff raise, but we have second pair and we know that we beat a decent amount of our opponent's three bet bluff range and even some of his value range. Our opponent can have things like ace queen, ace jack in his value range and we beat these hands so we definitely don't want to be folding on the flop, especially if our opponent has a very high c-bet frequency. So keep in mind that the exact strength of our hand depends on our opponent and depends on the action and the positions involved. So this is actually a pretty strong hand, pocket 10s on king 9 7 in the late position battle, but it's extremely weak in this scenario where we open raise from UTG and face a 3-bet from a tight small blind 3-better. Now let's look at the second example, which is going to be somewhat closer. And in this particular situation, the important thing to understand is that we are actually very, very close to a fold here as well, despite holding an overpair. And this is one situation where players often make mistakes and they overvalue the strength of that overpair. Perhaps they even end up calling down three barrels on blank runouts and then they feel that they are unlucky when their opponent wakes up with pocket kings or pocket aces, when in fact, those hands probably constitute the majority of his three barreling range. So unless he has as many bluffs, then it's not really that unlucky whatsoever. So this situation really all comes down to how many combinations of bluffs our opponent have. And one of the problem is, if he has queens, we still lose to queens anyway. So the only hand we beat, assuming he's 3-betting quite tight, is ace-king. And the problem is he may or may not see bet ace-king on this particular texture. So one thing that might be useful at this stage is maybe if you're not convinced so far is to pause the video and put the hands into poker stove or whichever equity calculator you use and first of all put your opponent's range as kings plus or maybe queens plus and it should be pretty easy to see why this is a standard fold um, against such a range and then try the calculation where he has queens plus and all combinations of ace king and we'll probably find that based on pot odds is going to be a call Although keep in mind we can't look directly at our pot odds at this stage because we're not necessarily closing the action with a call here. Even if we do call a flop, we still have to face bets on the turn and river. So if we're going to be folding any turn anyway, then we're going to need significantly better odds to actually call the flop in the first place. But if you put all combinations of ace-king in opponent's range, you'll find that we probably do actually have a call in this particular spot. We definitely have sufficient equity to call. Whereas if you put maybe half the combinations of ace-king in his range, you'll probably find that we still actually have a fold in this situation, especially when you consider the play on future streets. So one of the most important things to realize in this situation is that the pre-flop decision is based around getting the right odds to set mine. We're not necessarily calling tens here pre-flop because we expect to be good against our opponent's range. We are doing it because assuming the stacks are deep enough, we should be able to make enough money when we flop a 10 and stack our opponent's aces to make it profitable in the long run. And we can just about do this with 100 big blind stacks, provided our opponent doesn't three bet super large, and provided he has a tight range. So actually in this particular situation, it's actually favorable for us if our opponent has a very tight range. If he also mixes in some bluffs, then it's not gonna be as profitable a set mine, but we may also find that we have more profitable floating opportunities on the flop. But the reason we call in this case against a tight three better is purely to set mine. And generally set mining strategy doesn't involve floating or bluff raising any flops in the majority of cases, because if it did, it's not strictly a set mine. Set mining is basically calling with a pocket pair with the pure intention of flopping a set. And the basic strategy dictates that if we don't flop a set, we should generally be check folding. And that's certainly going to be the case on an 8-2-2 board in many scenarios. And as mentioned, a common problem is players severely overvalue the strength of the overpair in this particular case and end up calling two or even three barrels and then feeling that they're unlucky when their opponent has aces, when in fact that's probably the most likely hand he's holding when he three barrels, um, given how tight he is and given the pre-flop action. So if you recognize this particular situation, then hopefully you'll know a little bit 
better on how to approach these kind of spots uh, next time you face them. So we have one final example, and this is to do with our default strategy. So if we have no reads on our opponent, or even if we do have reads on our opponent, in order to make exploitative adjustments to our game, we need to know what our default game plan is in the first place. So we're just going to look very briefly at how we can construct a balanced floating range on a dry texture. So imagine the board texture is King 72 Rainbow. The first piece of information we really need is to understand what our range for getting to the flop width is in the first place. And if we don't know this, then we have to start with the preflop strategy before we can think about how we'd play on the flop. So our preflop calling range should probably look something like this. And we possibly don't need quite as many combinations of things like aces and kings or even ace-king, but it is good to keep in mind that theoretically we should protect our calling range with some combinations of strong hands such as aces and kings. So we don't want to always 4-bet queens plus an ace-king, otherwise this means our calling range is going to be capped, which is something we can potentially be exploited for. However, we probably don't need this many combos of strong hands, so we can probably reduce these somewhat. And also the reason why the combinations don't quite add up, for example, you can see there's only two combinations of kings, is that I've already put the flop texture into my equity calculator, so it's discounted the combinations of certain hands based on the king 7-2 rainbow, so there's only two combinations of kings left. In total, on a king 7-2 rainbow board, this is going to amount to 119 combinations of hands. So the next question we need to answer is, how do we know which percentage of these hands do we need to defend as part of a default strategy so that we don't become exploitable? The answer to this is based on our opponent's bet size. So let's take a standard bet size in a 3-bet pot, which is going to be round about half pot. And the way we calculate this is we simply look at how often our opponent's bet would need to work if it was a bluff. And the way we calculate this is very simply looking at the percentage of the pot our opponent is investing. So if he's betting half pot, and there's already pot size in the middle, this means the total size of the pot will be 1.5 times the pot size, and he's investing 0.5 of that. So we can see he's investing 33% in this particular case of the total pot, which essentially means that, assuming he is c-bet bluffing, if it works more than 33% of the time, then he's going to generate automatic profit with his continuation bet. So the way we defend unexploitably here is by making sure his bluff doesn't work more than 33% of the time. And the way we do that is we need to defend at least 67% of these hands, preferably slightly more because anytime we just call, our opponent gets to see a free turn card and you get some free equity in that situation. So as a rough guide, we should be defending just over 70% of this range. So we have 119 combos. The way we can work out 70% of this should be just basic maths, but if you're not familiar, then we take the number of combos, 119, and we multiply it by 70% expressed as a decimal. Or let's say we want to defend 72%, then we'll multiply this by 0 0.72, and we see how many combinations we need to continue with. So the next stage of this process is simply removing the worst hands in our range until we're left with 85 combinations. And there's not necessarily a set way to do this. We simply need to look at which we think are the best 85 combinations to defend and fold the weak ones. Keep in mind, though, that during this process, we definitely want to pay attention to backdoor draws. For example, we have hands here like 10-9 suited, and these could easily end up in our defending range on a king-7-2 rainbow board because they have plenty of available backdoor straights. But notice three of the four combos of 10-9 suited are going to have a backdoor flush as well. So what we might find is that we're not going to defend all combos of 10-9 suited, but we're definitely going to defend the ones that have backdoor flushes. And that's going to apply to many of the suited connector hands. We can probably instantly fold any suited connector that doesn't have a backdoor. We're probably only going to consider the suited connectors that have at least a backdoor flush draw. Same with some of these suited aces as well. Some of them will have backdoor flush draws, others won't. We probably are going to primarily think about folding the ones that don't have good backdoor flush draws first and take these out of our range until we're left with 85 combos. The reason we do this is, and I'm going to leave you to try and work out what should be a good calling range on this particular texture using this method.
So just remove hands until you're left with 85 combos. The reason we do this is because it gives us a rough idea of what our default calling range as part of a balance strategy should be on a King 72 rainbow board. This only tells us which kind of hand to defend on one specific texture, although there certainly are very similar textures. So if you do these calculations here and work out what your defending range is on a King 72 rainbow board, you'll probably also have a very good idea of what your defending range should be on a King 6-2 rainbow board or a King 8-2 rainbow board or even something like a Queen 7-2 might not be drastically different from what you choose to defend in this particular case. However, there are many other types of texture which are very different from a King 7-2. You have two-tone boards, monotone boards, you have low boards, you have boards with possible straights, drawier textures. And in order to have a rough idea what you should be doing by default on each of these textures, you have to do similar calculations, work out what your default defending range is, and then when you do find yourself in a situation where you are exploiting your opponent based on his stats, you have a starting point to deviate from. You have an understanding of how wide you are going based on what your default strategy should be. And of course, this is also very useful against unknown players who we suspect are reasonably good we know roughly what we should be defending even if we don't have any information on our opponent. But the way to get good at knowing what default ranges are is simply to do the calculations for a wide variety of board textures and not just board textures but remember how much the action impacts on correct defending ranges i.e. the position of the open raiser, the position of the three better. That's going to have a big effect on what kind of hands we're going to defend on various flop textures. Also keep in mind that our range for getting to the flop is going to differ as well based on the position we're in. So this could be our calling range when we open on the button and face a 3-bet from the blinds, but when we open from the cutoff and face a 3-bet from the blinds, we're going to find that we're probably defending a tighter range. That's going to have an impact on the types of hands we should be defending on the flop. So I recommend that you at the very least finish off this example with your own equity calculator and work out what your defending range should be on a King 7-2 rainbow board, but then maybe try a few different other textures and see what kind of results you get with. One thing to keep in mind is that this is a dry texture and it's a simple example because on a dry texture we defend our entire range on the flop by calling as we mentioned earlier in the video. Whereas on a drawy texture you have to start thinking about splitting your ranges up into bluff raising ranges, value raising ranges and calling ranges which is a little bit more complex because at least by default we probably want to make sure our bluff and value ranges are somewhat balanced so you will find that this example is a little bit trickier on a dry texture but certainly for dry textures shouldn't give you too much problems in working out what kind of hands you should defend and even if you don't split up your ranges immediately into raising ranges and calling ranges you can still use this method on any texture to give you an idea of what types of hands you should be continuing with regardless of whether you go for a raise or you decide just to float versus opponent's c-bet on the flop. Okay, so hopefully this has given you something to think about when playing as the caller against three bets. If you have any questions or anything didn't make sense then please just leave a question in the comments and I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. So thanks very much for watching. This has been Weasel for PokerVIP.com.